You can turn with me to Genesis 17. Genesis 17. As we continue to look at the Abrahamic covenant. While you're turning there, I will uh, echo uh, what Cody had mentioned a few moments ago, uh, that it was... Um, that it was great uh, dropping the kids off for camp and picking them up uh, yesterday, hearing how it went, um, seeing their excitement, at least in my van. I, I guess Cody's van was quiet. Mine was not. But uh, I paid him back. I, uh, we played the cup game, and I tormented your children. If, you're, if they're in my van, they were tormented by the cup game because I don't think any of them figured it out. Um, if you know, you know. So we'll play it again, and uh, some of them will probably catch up on it. But uh, anyway, I was able to turn the tables on them for at least a solid hour there. Genesis 17, and we'll read the entire chapter to start our time this morning. So I'll begin in verse number one. If you can follow along with me as I read, hear the word of the Lord. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father twelve princes, and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. When he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all those born in his house or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day. As God had said to him, Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised, and all the men of his house, those born in the house and those bought with money from a foreigner, 
were circumcised with him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we continue on. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us as we look to your word this morning. I pray that you'd help us to see the the foundational nature of this covenant that you made with Abraham, why it's so important, why it plays such an important role in redemptive history. And Father, I pray that it would serve as an example to us of how faithful you are. I pray that it would also serve as an example to us of what faith looks like, what obedience should flow from. May we have the same forward-looking faith that Abraham had. May we serve you faithfully, serve your kingdom faithfully, looking forward, knowing that you keep your promises. Father, I pray that you would just work in our hearts, sanctify us by your word, and I pray that ultimately you would be honored. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we look to Genesis 17 this morning, uh, I would submit to you that we're looking at the reaffirmation of God's covenant with Abram, whose name in this passage is changed to Abraham. We see the covenant being made in Genesis 15, and we see the reaffirmation of it here in Genesis 17. There's no doubt that covenant is the focus of this passage. The word covenant appears 13 times in this passage. I believe more than any other chapter of the Bible. So there's no denying that covenant is the focus here in this passage. And I'll be honest with you, theologians disagree over this covenant. Some say that it's the same covenant as Genesis 15, just being reaffirmed, and some say that it's a completely different covenant than Genesis 15. And and I understand they have their their reasons for this. They have their framework that surrounds that. Um, But I, I would submit to you, and I believe that it is a reaffirmation of the covenant in Genesis 15. And you you may ask, why, why do I personally believe this? Maybe you aren't asking that, but I'm going to tell you either way. Um, Why would I believe this? First of all, uh, the context. Abram is 99 years old. He was younger than 86 when the covenant was made in Genesis 15. Many years have passed since these promises were made to Abram, and he still had no son from his barren wife, Sarah. And we see along the way that his patience and his faith had been challenged. And he had failed. We see in Genesis 16 that he tries to fulfill the promise of an offspring on his own with his wife's handmaiden, Hagar. This was not God's plan. We see him taking matters into his own, his own hands. Sarah, Sarai comes to him and says, I, I haven't had a son yet. And this passage, this reaffirmation, even though it's multiple years, it's several years down the road, he's 99 now, Moses brings it up right after that failure with Hagar. So I believe the context points us to the fact that God is reaffirming this this covenant with Abram, that he is reaffirming his intention to keep the promises of an offspring and a land that he made in Genesis 15. I would submit to you also that the language of the passage points to it being a reaffirmation. The New English translation translates verses 1 and 2 this way, Walk before me and be blameless, then I will confirm my covenant between me and you. In verse number 7, it it translates it, I will confirm my covenant. The Legacy Standard Bible, which boasts of being a pretty literal translation, also uh, also translates 
verse number two with the word confirm. In the translation note of the New English translation, they even make it a point to explain their translational choice in verse number seven, and they say that the Hebrew verb, the way it's being used here, means to confirm, to give effect, to carry out. So the argument can be made even from a language standpoint that it's the same covenant as Genesis 15 being revisited, being repeated, being reaffirmed. But I would submit to you lastly as well that the content also points to it being a reaffirmation of the covenant from Genesis 15. Genesis 17 essentially has the same promises as Genesis 15. Just presented in a more full manner. It's fleshed out more, but it's still essentially the same promises that are mentioned in Genesis 15. To your offspring, I give this land. That's ultimately what we see being promised here, although more fleshed out. To your offspring, I will give this land. And so I would submit to you based on the context, the language, even the content, that this is the same covenant being revisited and reaffirmed. How does God initiate this interaction with Abram? He's now 99. We see it in verse, verses 1 and 2. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. We see God mention at least three things in these two verses. He's reminding Abram that he is God Almighty. And that's significant. Because once again, Abram is waiting on a son from Sarah. And so God initiates this interaction by reminding Abram that he is God Almighty. He also commands Abram to walk blamelessly before him. It could be argued that Abram hadn't walked blamelessly before him. He had failed in having a son with Hagar. And he comes to Abram indicating his intention to keep the promises he made to Abram, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. We see these first two verses almost serve as a preface to the rest of the passage. Almost like this is God's introduction to his sermon to Abraham. That he's telling Abraham here in this, this brief statement that he's God Almighty, walk blamelessly before me, that I may make my covenant, that I may multiply you. He's laying out for Abram what this conversation is going to look like. That God revisited Abraham when he was 90 years old, 99 years old, confirming the covenant promises, mandating the covenant sign of circumcision, and promising to establish the covenant through Sarah's son, Isaac. And as we'll see at the end of the passage, the result is that Abraham responded with faithful obedience. That's what we see happening in this passage. And that's what we see being introduced even in these first two verses of the passage. And so as a result, we'll consider the nature of this covenant this morning by looking at four of its dimensions. Four of its dimensions. First of all, the national dimension. Secondly, the conditional dimension. Thirdly, the supernatural dimension. And fourthly, the foundational dimension. This is an important covenant. All of redemptive history is affected by this covenant. It is foundational, as we'll see in a moment. So first of all, let us consider the national dimension of this covenant. Once again, what did God promise? He promised an offspring, and He promised 
land. And we see this being fleshed out in verses 3 through 8. We see, first of all, he tells Abram that he will make him into not just a nation, but nations, plural. I will make you nations. And he even changes Abraham or Abram's name to signify this promise. Your name is no longer going to be Abram. Your name is going to be Abraham. And he gives the reason in verse 7, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. So he's not, he's not only going to father one nation, he's going to father a multitude of nations. And so God changes his name to signify that promise. Abraham is going to have a large offspring. Nations will come from this man. Not just nations, but we see in verse number 6 that kings will come from this man. Kings will come from this man. Verse number 6, I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make you into nations and kings shall come from you. And we see this promise being fleshed out a little bit more toward the end of Genesis even. If you turn with me, keep your finger in Genesis 17, but turn to Genesis 49. Genesis 49. We see here that Jacob, Abraham's grandson, is blessing his sons, his 12 sons. In Genesis 49, verse number 8, he comes to his son Judah, and he says this to Judah, Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion, and as a lioness, who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not Depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Not just the people, but peoples. So we see this promise developed later on in the book of Genesis that not only will kings come from Abraham, but ultimately... Kings will come through his great grandson, Judah. That's the tribe that the kings of Israel would come from. And yet we see some phenomenal promises here about kingship, about a kingdom here in Judah. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies, your father's son shall bow down before you. Verse 10 the scepter shall not depart from Judah. What a wonderful promise. The scepter will not depart from this tribe. There will always be someone from Judah who is king. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. How is this promise ultimately fulfilled? It's fulfilled in the lion of the tribe of Judah. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of David, who sits on the throne of David forever. And look at the promise there. To him shall be the obedience of the peoples. The nations are going to obey Jesus Christ. They will. He will conquer his enemies. His foot will be on their necks. We see this all in seed form. All just a foretaste here in Genesis 17. Abraham, kings will come from you. Not just nations and kings, but nations and kings need something, don't they? Land. And we see that he promises 
Abraham's offspring a land. And it's worth noting that, that God, God is keeping these promises in Jesus Christ. The, some of those broader fulfillments as far as the king, you know, being the king of the nations and obedience coming to him. But it's worth noting as well that the promise of an offspring and the land, those promises were kept. God kept those promises. Israel, God did make Abraham a nation. God did give Abraham's offspring a land. We see that being confirmed according to Joshua 21, verses 43 through 45, that God kept these promises. 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 20 through 21, we see that God kept these promises. Even in Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 7 and 8, as they are looking forward to returning to their land from exile, they remember the fact that God had kept His promises to Abraham. That He had brought Abraham's offspring into the land. God kept these promises. Why did Israel end up leaving the land? Because of disobedience, because of unfaithfulness, because of breaking covenant. But God kept these promises. He gave Abraham an offspring. He brought them into the land. Those things happened historically. It's undeniable. God kept all these promises. It'd be worth noting, just take comfort in that. Take comfort. We worship and serve a God who keeps all of His promises. He does not fail to keep His promises. We worship and serve a God who keeps all of His promises. This is the national dimension of this covenant. We see also a conditional dimension. God mandated something in this covenant. He mandated obedience. Once again, verses 1 and 2, he comes to Abraham, Abram at that time, says, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. God is mandating obedience. He's mandating faithfulness. And we see that specifically in the sign of circumcision. Beginning in verse number 9, look at it with me. Genesis 17, verse number 9, God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. And it's very extensive. He says not only those who are biologically Abraham's seed, but even those foreigners who are now uh, part of the nation. They're supposed to be circumcised. In verse 17, he sums it up by saying, any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So we see that God mandates obedience specifically in the form of circumcision. Remember this. It, the, timing, the timing is impeccable that we just looked at chapter 9 of the confession in free will. God made promises that He intended to keep. That Abraham would have an offspring and that they would have a land. And yet God holds people responsible to obey and to keep covenant. It was an undeniable fact that Abraham would have offspring and that his offspring would inherit a land. And yet he tells Abraham and his offspring to keep covenant and to be obedient. God uses our obedience as a means of bringing about his sovereign purposes. God uses means. He doesn't just decree the ends. He decrees the means. God uses means. 
I believe that Jesus will inherit the nations because that's what the Bible says. Yet God requires obedience out of you and me that we're supposed to go and make disciples of the nations. God's purposes are going to be fulfilled. Jesus is going to inherit the nations, and yet there is a requirement of obedience. There is a means that God has ordained of bringing about His purposes. And so yes, God is sovereign. Yes, His purposes will be fulfilled, and yet He holds men responsible to obey. We see this sign of circumcision was an important aspect of this covenant. It's undeniable. You can't read verses 9 through 14 and not see the fact that circumcision was an important part of this covenant. In fact, Stephen calls it the covenant of circumcision. It set Israel apart from all other nations. God said to Abraham, this would, this would be a sign of my covenant. It was a seal of the blessings that God had promised. Not only that, it was a sign of the curses. It was a sign of the curses. Look at verse 14 again. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. It was a sign of the curses, quite literally. Like, I'm not going to get into all the details of circumcision, but he basically says if you're not circumcised, you will be cut off. It was a sign of what would happen for breaking covenant. One thing that we also should take note of is it had a deeper symbolism as well. It had a deeper symbolism, a symbolism which Abraham's physical offspring often missed. And that is, it symbolized regeneration. It symbolized the change that God makes in a person's heart. Keep your finger in Genesis 17, but just turn with me briefly to Philippians chapter 3. <clears throat> Philippians 3. In verse number 3, the Apostle Paul writing to the Philippians says this in verse 3, For we are the circumcision. Who? Who are the circumcision? For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. That is true circumcision. That is spiritual circumcision. Putting no confidence in the flesh. In fact, turn with me to Colossians chapter 2, a passage that I just read to you a few moments ago for the assurance of pardon. Colossians 2. In verse number 11. In Him, that's in Jesus, in Him also you were circumcised with what kind of circumcision? With a circumcision made without hands. We're not talking about physical circumcision here. Verse 11, in Him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised with Him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised Him from the dead. Verse 13, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. What does Paul liken to being dead in your trespasses. It's like being uncircumcised. And what does is, what is what is Paul liken the putting off the body of the flesh, the having been 
raised to newness of life, what does he liken that as being circumcised with the circumcision made without hands? What was the problem of those who rejected Christ in the first century? Those, those Jews, those, those ones that Paul mourns over. He says, I, I wish I could be cut off for my kinsmen according to the flesh. He mourns over his fellow Jews who do not believe in the Messiah. What was their problem? They had physical circumcision. They did not have the circumcision that's made without hands. They did not have the reality that, that circumcision ultimately pointed toward. Turn back with me to Genesis 17. We see not only that God mandated obedience and circumcision specifically in this covenant, we see, we see there are two aspects to this. There is personal and corporate aspects to this covenant and these conditions. God made unconditional promises to Abraham that he kept. And he kept them corporately. Abraham had an offspring. That offspring received the land. Those promises were kept corporately to the nation that came from Abraham. However, not all individuals received the promises. Not all individuals received the promises. Once again, verse number 14, if you aren't circumcised, you're cut off. So there were individuals who did not receive the blessings of this covenant because they were cut off from it by not obeying the sign of circumcision. There were those just due to personal disobedience in general who did not inherit these promises. One notable one is Moses. Moses did not enter the promised land because of disobedience. The nation entered but he did not. He struck the rock instead of speaking to it. So we see that there are personal and, and corporate aspects to this condition. Yes, God kept these promises unconditionally in a corporate sense, but there were individuals who were cut off from this covenant, cut off from the blessings of this covenant because of personal disobedience. Notice with me thirdly, the supernatural dimension of the covenant. Verse 15, And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. God would make Abraham into nations, and he would do it through Sarah's son, Isaac. God would make Abraham into nations, kings would come from him, and he would do it through his wife's name, or through his wife's son, Isaac. Changes Sarai, Sarai's name to Sarah and says, nations will come from her. Kings will come from her. She is the wife that you will receive these blessings from Abraham. Not only would God make Abraham into nations through Sarah's son Isaac, but God would miraculously make Abraham into nations through Sarah's son Isaac. Look at verse 17. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? 
You can see the shock in Abraham. I'm 100 years old. I'm going to have a son through my 90-year-old wife who has never had any children. Don't miss it. Abraham's age seems to be intentionally highlighted by Moses in this passage of Scripture. It's mentioned three times. It says at the beginning of the passage, God appeared to Abraham when he was 99 years old. And then when, when Abraham hears this promise that nations will come through Sarah, he says, I'm 100 years old. And then it says at the end of the passage that Abram, Abraham is circumcised at 99 years old. It's like Moses is trying to get it through the head of his readers. This is an old guy. It should be a shock that he's going to have a son through his 90-year-old wife who's been barren her whole life. We actually see this emphasized by the Apostle Paul in Romans 4. He repeats the promise and he, he says that the promise was kept to Abraham who was, quote, good as dead. Good as dead. And then the writer of the Hebrews says the same thing. That Sarah, he says, first of all, Sarah received power to conceive. So it's miraculous. It wasn't just a fluke. God gave her the power to conceive. And then it says that she conceived through him who was as good as dead. Twice in the New Testament, it says that Abraham was good as dead when he had a son through Sarah. Why? Because this is a miracle. This is a miracle. It's supernatural. He's 99 years old. She's 90 years old. And she's been barren her entire life. We see the supernatural dimension. God would keep this covenant miraculously, through, through Sarah's son, Isaac. This just reminds us, it reminded Abraham, and it reminds us as well, that once again, verse number one, how does God start out this whole thing? He's almighty. What is this a reminder of? That God is almighty. He's almighty. Old age and barren wombs, are no match for God. He's almighty. And keep in mind that God does all things in His own timing and for His own glory. God does all things in His own timing and for His own glory glory. And the kicker to that is those who put their trust in Him are not put to shame. We see that promise all through the New Testament. Those who trust in Christ are not put to shame. Abraham's 99 years old. He still hasn't received these promises, but he has faith. And the end result was he wasn't put to shame. He believed the promises of God and God kept his promises. We got to move quickly. The foundational dimension of this covenant. Don't miss the historical significance of this covenant. It is important for all of the Bible. It pointed to the Mosaic covenant, which is the next covenant we'll look at in a couple of weeks. It pointed to the Mosaic covenant. It's in the Mosaic covenant that obedience was necessary to entering the land and staying in the land. 
God is requiring obedience from the offspring of Abraham so that they would enter the land and stay in the land. And it's in the Mosaic Covenant that Abraham's offspring, his nation, actually does inherit the land. Abraham's children inherit Abraham's land under the Mosaic Covenant. It points us to the Mosaic Covenant. It pointed to the Davidic Covenant. It pointed to the Davidic Covenant. Once again, David is a king. Kings come from Abraham. David is a king descended from Abraham. And ultimately, we see that Jesus, the king of kings, descended from Abraham and was promised to David in the covenant made with him. And ultimately, it pointed to the new covenant. It pointed to the new covenant, or we could say it this way, the full, it pointed to the full and final revelation of the covenant of grace. Remember, we have covenant of works, covenant of grace. Covenant of grace is initially revealed to Adam in Genesis 3.15. It's progressively revealed step by step. We're, we're there, right? We're there with Abraham's life. It's being progressively revealed more and more. We're getting more and more details of how God is going to redeem Adam's fallen race. Now we know it's going to be from the offspring of Abraham who will be a king. It pointed to the new covenant, the full and final revelation of the covenant of grace. Jesus came from Abraham's nation. That's why the genealogies in the Gospels are so important. The writers of the Gospels are establishing that it, Jesus is fulfilling these promises. He's the one who came from Abraham. Once again, this is a critical covenant. If you have no nation, you have no Jesus. I'd say that's foundational, wouldn't you? Why is it so important that God keeps this covenant with Abraham? Because if you have no nation of Israel, you have no Jesus. And if you have no Jesus, you have no salvation. We see that it's through the covenant of grace made with Jesus, not specifically the Abrahamic covenant, that the promise made to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3 comes to pass. In Abraham, or in his offspring, all the families, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That promise is ultimately fulfilled in the new covenant, in the covenant of grace. You actually don't see that promise mentioned in the Abrahamic covenant. It's not in Genesis 15. It's not in Genesis 17 because it's not fulfilled through the Abrahamic covenant. It's fulfilled in the covenant of grace. But the Abrahamic covenant is critical to the covenant of grace being fulfilled. Because if you have no nation, you have no Jesus. And if you have no Jesus, you have no blessing for all the nations. See the wisdom and faithfulness of God in this. See the wisdom and faithfulness of God in how he has set out to redeem an amazing amount of Adam's fallen sons and daughters to bear his image in his creation. Would it have been awesome and gracious if God sent the Redeemer right after the garden and redeemed Adam and Eve? For sure. Would it have been awesome if he sent the Redeemer in Abraham's lifetime? For sure. It's amazing. It's amazing that nations from all over the globe will be blessed by God's Redeemer through his redemptive plan. And his covenant with Abraham is key to that. It's through Abraham's offspring that all the families of the earth, all the nations are blessed. It's through Abraham's offspring that there, are, there is an amazing amount of image bearers that will bring glory to God in the new creation 
Don't, don't miss this with me lastly. We'll, we'll look once again at Genesis 17, verse 22. We see Abraham's response. We see, we see something that we've mentioned over the last couple of weeks. We'll mention it again. Abraham's obedience, which flows from his faith. Verse 22, when he had finished talking with God, God went up from Abraham. So what does Abraham do? Then Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all those born in his house were bought with his money. Every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day. As God had said to him, that was not a good day for the men in his household. But a necessary day. That very day, Abraham obeys. Circumcises every male in his household. See Abraham's obedient faith. See Abraham's obedient faith. And let me just let me just pose you with this question. Is there any other kind of faith? Is there a disobedient faith? Does that make sense? There's only one kind of faith, an obedient faith. Faith obeys looking forward. Abraham still had no son. No son, no land. He obeys God that very day. Because faith obeys looking forward. It looks forward to what God has said he will do. It looks forward to God's promises. And it obeys in light of those promises. Faith obeys looking forward. Which brings me to this concluding thought. Our faith should be eschatological. It's a huge word. Eschatology refers to the study of last things, future things. Our, our faith should be eschatological. In other words, we should have an obedient faith that looks ahead to God's promises. We should have an obedient faith that looks ahead to God's promises being fulfilled in Jesus. Do we obey looking forward? Do we obey believing the promise that in Abraham's offspring, all the families of the earth will be blessed? All the nations? I, I understand people have different labels they use for eschatology, right? Some people are premillennial, some people are amillennial, some people are postmillennial. Let me just let me just encourage you to to be something today. Okay? Be Abraham millennial. Be Abraham millennial. What does that mean? That through Abraham's offspring, the Lord Jesus Christ, all families, all nations of the earth will be blessed. Do you believe that? You should. If that doesn't work out with my premillennialism, then you need to think about your premillennialism. This is an explicit promise, and Paul tells us it's about the gospel in Galatians 3. He tells us it's about Jesus. All families of the earth will be blessed through Abraham's offspring. All right, so you don't like the term amillennial or postmillennial, be Abraham millennial. I'm pretty sure I created that. All families of the earth will be blessed through Abraham's son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that. Endure the race of faith, believing that. Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, believing that. 
serve God's kingdom believing that. Say, will Jesus come back soon? I don't know. All I know is I don't think all the nations have been blessed yet. And he says they all will be. So we should have a faith that looks forward. We should obey looking forward. We should run the race of the Christian life running forward, we sh- looking forward. We should, we should preach looking forward. We should serve looking forward. We struggle with that, don't we? Many of us, we think we're good if we're thinking 20 years down the road, 30 years down the road, 40 years maybe down the road. Maybe you're thinking about what Northbridge will look like for your children. Maybe you're, look, you're thinking about what Northbridge will look like for your grandchildren. Maybe, I hope. Maybe you're thinking about what Kalamazoo will look like in 40 years. Let's, let's make that chunk of time bigger. Let's look ahead to the global promises in Abraham. What does Northbridge look like in 100 years? What does Kalamazoo look like in 100 years? In light of the promise that all families of the earth will be blessed. Let's obey looking forward. Let's obey looking forward 100 years. Let's obey believing that promise and looking forward to that promise. Let's look beyond our lifetime. Abraham had to look 400 years ahead. He had to obey looking 400 years ahead. I'm asking you to obey looking 100 ahead. Why? Because that's what faith does. Faith obeys looking forward. It's eschatological. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for keeping your promises. Give us the grace to remain faithful and obedient, looking forward to the promises yet to be fulfilled in your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to obey looking forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.